Friday, October 19, 2018, and I'm at the LGBT Community Center with Marcia Tate, interviewing her for the Stonewall Oral History Project. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great privilege and, and an honor to do this, to uh, be a part of something great that is live on for posterity. A piece of me is gonna be left along uh, behind for um, generations to come to uh, get a, um, a mind's eye view of what my life was, you know, or my experiences was. Exactly, that's really, and I really appreciate it. So in oral history, we always start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me where and when you were born? And oh time? yes, I'm gonna tell you. <clears throat> my name, uh, well, I, I had several names, <laughs> but um, my my birth name, you know, was uh, Maurice Marcel, and uh, I changed it later to Marcia, Brianna, Christian, uh, Chase, and Agada. I am a married woman. I was uh, born in um, the Virgin Islands, Christian State, uh, United States Virgin Islands, St. Croix. And then thereafter, I was uh, taken to Barbados, where my father's from. My fa father is from Christchurch, Barbados. And um, my mom is from Maguas, Puerto Rico. And uh, there was some family issues, and I was shipped off to Barbados. So I, I grew up in Barbados, in Christchurch, Barbados, you know. And later on, the family had moved to Honduras, and I went to school in Honduras. So I consider myself more Garifuna than Bajan and Acrusian, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, because it's uh, where my formative years, you know, was uh, spent, and where kind of I got a relationship with Marcia that I knew. I was Marcia, I was a Marcel, I was a Maurice, you know, so Marcia came alive in Honduras. You know, that's where she was born, you know, that I had consciousness of my difference, you know. And um, it was hard for me to exist in my difference in, in, in that space. My, my family then um, sent me back to the Virgin Islands. I graduated high school in 1981. <clears throat> and then I had scholarship and I went to Florida a and University. I got a bachelor's in um, early childhood education and psychology minor and history. I have two minors in history. And then I, I, I didn't know really what to do with my life. I um, bounced around from jobs. I had some really nice jobs. I um, later on went to nursing school, became an LPN, did that for a while. Then I went back to school in the 2000, um, 12, 13, 14, and I studied surgical technology. But I always been doing community organizing work because in the Virgin Islands, I was a health occupation student in the Virgin Islands as a vocational student. I did the craziest thing. I was considered boy to be in a health occupation class and having to wear candy stripes. <laughs> Now all nursing, you know, students will wear candy stripes, and the candy stripe with these fine little white lines were broad stripes. And uh, my older sister was um, given the task in um, making me a smock <laughs> with the candy stripe. And we had to wear this uniform for like four class periods to get one grade, one grade in that vocational class of health occupation, learning the basic nursing skills. And at the end of the three years, you'll be able to take the licensed vocational exam. And luckily I took it and I passed it. So I came out of high school as a graduate LPN vocational nurse from high school. I left school with a, high, a career so <clears throat> in leaving high school with a career, I was able to make money, take care of myself, dress the way how I wanted because my parents, you know, I transitioned at home. I had a great mom. My mom and my dad had divorced, which was very painful for the family, but I had a wonderful mom. My mom accepted me being transsexual, transgender. I transitioned at home and um, it was, it was something in, in my mind that set me apart from a lot of the other transsexuals and transgender friends that was growing up amongst me because I continued in my tran transition to having had uh, post-operative surgery in 2004 <clears throat> and a lot of my counterparts hadn't. So, you know, I had had, you know, my life, 
you know, and navigating it as a woman early on, early on. So, <clears throat> you know, having lived my life as a female for so long, you know, I then uh, moved to the States because um, navigating the life of a woman in the Caribbean is different coming from Caribbean privilege because my, my dad <clears throat> owned a company called Chase Plumbing and Piping Corporation. So I had a name and I had an image to protect for my family because my father was public doing all these construction and plumbing works for all the businesses and families in the Virgin Islands. So whenever I step out, my last name being Chase was under circumspect. So I always had to downplay myself, you know, and not bring embarrassment to my family. You know, so soon after I decided that my life was my own, I left, you know, St. Croix and I hadn't went back. And I had heard that there was a pageant, you know, in 1985, and it was Miss Kay Virgin Islands, and I'm here in the States. So I heard about them having a pageant. So I said, let me go back and just compete. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't think much of anything about it, but I won this pageant. <laughs> I won, and, and, and it was like really strange for me because you know, you know to have the, the gay in the pageant was kind of like funny, but you know, in that, in that place, to be transgender is considered gay. You know, it's, it's one of those things that you don't see transgender people as their, you know, normal gender. And they don't really separate um, gender and sexual orientation. They think they're one and the same, <laughs> you know. And I think that's for those people that, you know, don't have the um, exposure to um, education and stuff like that. Because they're a really tight-knit community. And, you know, in the Virgin Islands, there are pockets, you know, east, west, you know, center line, you know. And you have, you know, um, uh, um, um, people from, you know, Wim, East Estate, you know, Humbug, you know, I grew up in Peter's Rest. My grandmother used to live in, in the town in Christianstead, you know, where we were all born and stuff. And, um, you know, it, it, it coming from that, you know, environment where, you know, there was, um, you know, um, freedom of expression, I would say, you know, had set me on a course to just be. But then coming to the Americas, you know, my challenges was why other people didn't have the kind of freedoms that I had. You know, because it's like people would think that because you're on a Caribbean island, like you're impoverished and you have nothing and you have no freedom and you have nowhere to go and you can't, you know, I mean, you know, St. Thomas the Virgin Islands is very gay, very open, very free. You know, I, I, I the, the, the imagination of the people in the continental United States that how they think about other places in the world is very strange because it's like, you know, it's a U.S. territory, so why wouldn't the same thing exist? And it's open to uh, tourism, which is the major part of our sustenance, tourism. So it would be, you know, on their behalf to think that, you know, everything would have penetrated the Virgin Islands and exists in the Virgin Islands, you know what I'm saying? But nobody knows the Virgin Islands. Nobody really goes to the Virgin Islands or talk about the Virgin Islands or, or no, you know? And uh, I was like sort of like uh, putting back by that experience. But, you know, I, I, after graduation, I said to myself that, you know, my um, transgender community needed me, you know, being Afro-Caribbean Latina, you know, I have a composite of both experiences culturally, and having had it that difficulty to own space, you know, I felt like some sort of a puzzle without edges. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, you know, the pieces are there, you know, I know there's a frame, right? But you know, the, the, there's, there's no edges, you know, it's like that, you know. And, um, you know, I had to reconnect to, you know, my community and the community that I felt, you know, most safe, you know, in. Because uh, in, in, in the Caribbean, like, my community was where I live. Everybody looked like me, sound like me, act like me, you know. I mean, I knew do black doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers. So I, everything about me was was always seen and it was always possible. I never, 
knew that, you know, people had not seen, you know, people in high places and high station, you know, other than on TV. I mean, in my mind, I couldn't fathom that because, you know, even, um, you know, the, the, the wonderful, you know, uh, I, I always call her the matriarch of the lesbian uh, movement, Audre Lorde, was a great friend of my mom. And I knew her personally. There's a picture somewhere that got lost in the shuffle that um, Audre Lorde used to come to my house. And um, my sisters refer to her as the, man, the woman that acts like a man. <laughs> because um, she, she was there doing some organizing. And um, my mother used to do a lot of community organizing. So it was like in my blood, you know. And I probably was being submersed by it in some kind of way through the osmotic process. I was absorbing it, not knowing, like I was absorbing what they were talking about and the shift in the power and femininity and feminism and all these kind of different things. And she took to me because I always remember, I, I closed my eyes and I could always remember her face with the freckles by her nose because I always used to be touching her freckles. And I'm, I'm begging my sisters to find that picture with me sitting in her lap because I remember it, you know, you know, before my mom had passed, you know, unfortunately for me, you know, uh, 2016 on um, May um, 25th, my mother uh, made her transition and um, she was my best friend and I, I wanted to keep that picture of me sitting on Audra. Well, my mother never called her Audrey, she called her Audra. <laughs> that was her friend Audra Lord. And uh, they were like society women and doing all these kind of stuff. And I kind of got, you know, into that leadership role like early because I used to do things on the island and write plays and skits. And it was always art scene stuff and being thrown into, um, to call these things, um, um, oratorical contests, which is like speech, you know, um, contests and stuff like that. And I participated. I, a couple of them I won, a couple of them I placed second, and you know, and there was always monetary prizes and stuff like that. So, you know, public speaking was a thing. You know, it was always in my family. My mother always had us stand up because her beginning job, she was a, a kindergarten teacher and then she left and uh, she owned a couple of businesses and then she went to work for the bank. And uh, she was a Sunday school teacher and big in religion, you know, big all oh, church every day of the week. If, 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 oh my God, you know, that's like the love that I knew, you know, it all begins with God, right? And it begins and ends with you, you know, my mom would say. And I, I, I knew I needed to make myself available because I'm not looking I'm not looking for recognition on a public level. I don't want to be a poster girl, but I, I want to be inclusive. I want to be inclusive to the movement in saying that I was there, you know, and I played a part of the movement. I saw it, I experienced it, I lived it. Uh, the matriarchs on the other side um, of the trans movement, um, Marsha P. Johnson and uh, Sylvia Rivera. I knew them very well. I knew them very well personally. And, um, you know, I, I had so much interactions with them. And I, 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 I am so, you know, in an armored and privileged to have met these two amazing women. You know, amazing. When I say amazing, amazing. You know, I had, um, bad experiences with both of them. I saw um, Masha attacked at a rally in, in Washington Square Park. And uh, I saw um, Sylvia, you know, she did not, was not allowed to go into Pandora's, a lesbian club. You know what I'm saying? And I, I figured that, you know, Sylvia being lighter skin, you know, and me being a black girl, that they would not have let me into the lesbian bar. But the lesbians didn't think that Sylvia was, you know, good enough or female enough or whatever those politics, you know, was about that they did not want Sylvia to come into Pandora's box. 
and, uh, and, and, and an identified lesbian, you know, and, uh, and uh, it, it, you know, even though being a trans woman, and th that was like a very disheartening and my first, you know, like experience with how, you know, we ourselves in the LGBTQ community oppress each other. That was like my first experience that I was like, I couldn't believe that a lesbian bar was rejecting another lesbian that they didn't consider lesbian. And I, 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 for years, I didn't understand it. You know what I'm saying? And I didn't understand that, why would they do it to Sylvia? Because she was so, you know, like, important to the lesbian movement where, you know, out of her works and, and, and the abuses that she suffered and all the traumas, you know, came the Dyke March. And, uh, you know, uh, Sylvia and I did the Dyke March, you know, as trans women, because, you know, uh, I never knew the word pansexual had existed even then. I don't think that it had uh, even existed in, like, even in the early 80s. But um, I had had, you know, a relationship with a female, and I produced a daughter and stuff like that, and I considered myself not to be lesbian, but to be pansexual, because um. I love the person that loves me. You know, I, I don't get into that gender thing. You know, I mean, I happen to be married to a man because he loves me. You know, had a woman uh, fallen in love with me and me falling in love with a woman, I would be her wife, she would be my wife. You know what I'm saying? Because I just love who loves me. I don't look at the gender and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, Stonewall in the history, Stonewall, I mean, uh, you know, I've, I've heard s several versions. You know, I've heard Marsha P. Johnson's version, I've heard Sylvia's version, and about the pandemonium and all the terror that had happened that evening, and how, um, you know, um, fast and rapid that traction had taken, and it had sparked something. It was like something very kinetic that had sparked a movement all over the, ro the world that all these different places, you know, started, you know, mimicking what had happened here in New York, you know? And I missed that experience, but just having met them, and when I met them, and they were telling me how electrifying that evening was, and what they had did that night and being tired of, you know, being harassed by the police and being policed by the police and policed by the people in the neighborhood. And, you know, this area, you know, was the, the home that they had made it a home. They had claimed it because it was filthy and it was the trans women who was cleaning it up. And, and the artsy, fartsy people, you know, was, was mean to the trans women. They were very mean to the trans women. And, and I, this have to be stated that, you know, people talk about, you know, the eclectic face of the Lower East Side and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it was a very, like, I guess, bohemian at that time. But it was the trans women that, the energy of the trans women that were here made it bohemian, made it artsy, made it eclectic and fun and, and a very creative, you know, kind of a untouchable, you know, beautiful, but dark. You know, it's like I, I, I say that, you know, life is brutal and beautiful, brutal full, you know, life is brutal full, brutal and beautiful together. You know, I got to put that on a t-shirt that life is brutal full. And the bu brutality of, um, you know, the policing, you know, on queer and trans people, you know, during that time, you know, was um, unimaginable because for me, you know, growing up, you know, in the Virgin Islands and Honduras, you know, and visiting Puerto Rico, I mean, I might have been like encapsulated or in some kind of time warp because, you know, I guess coming from a big family, unknowingly, like I was protected in my transness and that had its own sense of privilege. You know, my father having a namesake and my mother being a woman and like a, a, the queen on a chessboard that I could have got go anywhere I want to go as myself and not question. And coming to New York, it was something that 
all this privilege that I had was now erased. I was no longer who I thought that I was. So let me stop you. So when did you come to New York? I that? came to New York in 1983. I went to Florida in m University, graduated. Mind you, I did a four-year program in almost three years. And when were you born? I was born in August 8, 1963. I have a daughter born, born August 8. Whoa! Isn't that wonderful? Leos are great people, you know? Just don't step on the tail. Exactly. Exactly. And we'll give you the shirt off our it's, backs. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good day. <laughs> so you're 20 years old, you come to New York, you have a, a confidence that would be unusual for a trans woman who grew up here, right? I mean, that's yes, so yes. What, so what did... What did it feel like when you got here and you realized that it was such a, so different? Well, you know, I used to come here on summers. You know what I'm saying? So I always had a relationship with New York and coming to visit with summers and stuff. But I didn't have a transgender connection or a transgender community because I was considered a girl. I, was, I had lived my life in the Virgin Islands as a woman. But to come to New York, I was something else. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, my, my name wasn't changed. You know, the whole legal of who I was wasn't changed. So it was like, well, you look like that, but your ID says like this. So those things, you know, I had to navigate. That's why I left the Virgin Islands, because I never even had thought about changing my name or my gender marker or anything in the Virgin Islands, because I never was questioned about any of those things, right? I never was questioned about it. You know, I had jobs. You know, my check had Maurice Marcel. I changed it. I never mattered, you know, because in spaces where people might have given me uh, trouble, I had already navigate not to enter, right? So I, I never even, you know, had to, you know, deal with that experience. But coming here, 20 years old, l presenting one thing, you know, in front of another person and my document saying another thing was a, a conflict. And then my, my self-esteem started to erode. My self-esteem started to erode. And then from there, you know, I sort of uh, got um, directions that um, maybe you should try street sex work. Right? It was like this coercive kind of bad whisper, bad devil, good devil kind of stuff. And uh, a girl had said to me, like, yeah, let's take a walk to 16th Street. You know, this is what, you know, takes place on 16th Street. And I thought she was a girl, but I didn't know she was like me. You know, and it was so funny. She knew that I was. But I thought she didn't know, and I thought that she was, you know? So it was, like, so funny when, you know, she had said to me, oh, you're drag, right? And I'm like, drag what? Because I never knew the lingo. I never knew there was a queer language. I never knew, you know, trans shop talk. I never heard that language. So my thing is, like, I'm a drag. I mean, I'm thinking... I'm boring to you. You know, I'm literally defined because I'm thinking denotation. I'm like, I'm a drag to you. You call me boring. We were talking from 42nd Street to 60th Street. She said, no, I mean, like, you're a queen. And I'm like, no, I'm not a queen, but I want a pageant. <laughs> yeah. I gave up my crown last year. So I'm saying to her, oh, you should have come to the pageant because... You know, now I'm thinking that she knew about Miss Gay Virgin Islands, you know what I'm saying? Because she had some family, like, close to Bahamas or somewhere. So I'm thinking, like, oh, you know, we're totally having, like, a, sh a weird conversation. Like, she's telling me this word. There was two words, drag, queen. I'm thinking, like, well, I'm boring, and I'm thinking queen. Well, I did win a pageant. I'm thank you for the compliment, you know? <laughs> so... Here we arrive to 16th Street, and there are hundreds, I mean, like hundreds of, 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 of drag, because she explained to me, now we were on the corner of 16th Street and 8th Avenue, and um, there's all these beautiful women. In my mind, this is all beautiful women. 
And I was shocked. I, I, I almost, I, I, I was verklempt. You know, there was this like tall, she must have been like maybe like six feet three. And, and she had these large, like gigantuous boobs and, and, a, and a butt. And she was like dressed from head to toe in, in, in red, red hair, red lashes, red nails. And her body was so curvaceous. And there was a penis, and I, I, I had never seen anything like that in my whole life. You know, even not. It was like it's such a, a, a divorce from my own relationship to my personal nudity, how I see myself, and how I, 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 I was confused about how maybe they related to themselves and. Why the vulgarity? I'm asking in my mind, like, why are you walking the street like that? I mean, like, cover yourself. Like, women don't do that. Like, you, you know, do, are you asking to be killed? Like, covered something. But I didn't know that there was prostitution going on. I didn't know that this is what they do. This is this was common stay because I'm coming from a, an island that is. Uh, 82 square miles long and four miles wide. You could never do that. You could never walk out your door voluptuous and, and you know, the women dress clad, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a marina that is like chicken wire, but you'll put a bathing suit underneath. She was completely nude. There was nothing left to the imagination. And, 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 and I was like, no, I cannot, I cannot stand to this corner. I cannot be around these people. You know, I, I was like, this is, this is definitely not me. Like, you know, are you crazy? I mean, what do you do here? So there was a, um, a bakery. And uh, she said, oh, uh, walk with me to the bakery. You know, and on our way there, we met a gentleman, and uh, he had introduced himself as the doctor. His name was Fred. And uh, he was so in love with me, and he loved my dimple, and he was like, he made me feel, feel so comfortable. And he had talked about, you know, just, just, you know, if you need a shot, you know, just give me $10. You know, you're so beautiful, I'll give you a shot. And I'm like, things just like going fast. You know, I just met this girl. I don't know what she mean about a queen. I don't know what it is about a drag. This one is naked with all them tits and the ass with the penis. I'm gonna die. Like, you know, he's telling me he's gonna give me a shot when he wants to kill me is heroin. I'm gonna die. Like, mom, come and get me. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, like, you know, but this person that I'm with is very interesting. Let me, let me, I don't wanna go. I wanna probe this person for more because you know well I guess I'm a queen because we got something in common you know she looked like that I got that you know I identified I guess well I guess I'm a queen you know so went into the bakery sat down we had tea it was fresh bread and the girls and there were more girls in and out, in and out, in and out. They'll come in and they'll go in the back and they'll they'll do whatever and the bakery will let them like like stash clothes or whatever. And there was all sorts of things going on going on in the um the, the, the bakery there on 14th Street. And um, it was like it was like a, a safe house and, and, and that bakery on 14th Street should have been, you know, a trans landmark because it protected the girls on 14th Street. It, it was like a safe haven for the girls on 14th Street that was doing the street sex work. You know, when I came here, what was it, called? What was it I it was it was like a Polish bakery. I can never remember the name, but I know where it is. 14th, uh, right here, 14th and 7. Uh, it's like one of those Polish. Uh, it's a restaurant now, but it was the bakery. Yeah, right here, right around the corner. It was the bakery right in the middle of the block, and all the girls would hang out there. And um, it, it was it was like the best night of my life. You know, I, I, I laughed. I, I met Fred, the street doctor, and <laughs> there it is. I met this girl that said to me, like, I'm a drag. And then I, I, I kept hearing drag, 
queen, I put them together, oh, I'm a drag queen. You know, I didn't know what that was, or, you know, they'll say like, oh, that's, that's, that's a drag, you know, or that's a queen, and then eventually the word drag had left, and it was just like, oh, you're a queen, you know, and, uh, you know, having all this education about African history and all that kind of stuff, and the men in the Caribbean always called me a queen. Like, when they saw me, they said, that's a queen. You know, they always, always from the time I was uh, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I would always hear the Caribbean men refer to me as a queen. So I was like, wow, I was a queen before I knew I was a queen, and then I won a pageant, and I became a queen, and then I came to New York, and this girl told me I was a drag queen, so I am a queen. <laughs> I finally, it clicked. It finally, the pieces came together, and right there that night, I decided that I would come to 14th Street and go to 16th Street and 18th Street and 20th Street, and I start meeting different women, different women, different women, and then I met a young lady by the name of Mada. You know, God, may she rest in peace. There was a, a club. Uh, called um, Edelweiss. And Edelweiss was a place where the trans used to go. That was the, the club, and uh, right. you would do, they would do uh, drag shows, and uh, it, was, it was just a place to be. And then it was another place, Sally's Hideaway. And I was exposed to, to Sally's Hideaway, and uh, I would go there and meet other girls and see the show, and I would see, you know, Marsha um, in, in, in the, the place not too far from Lollapalooza. I would go there too, and then uh, before Silk Stockings, there was another club that used to be there, and I used to go to that club too, and I used to see the same faces in the same spaces, and I, I, I was like so enamored by this, like wow, you know, there's a, a community. Um, I got into uh, uh, this uh, organization, um, the Lower East Side, uh, uh, Lower East Side uh, Needle Exchange. It came out of that. And uh, they were doing uh, some uh, community organizing. They were doing some community organizing. And I met Sylvia, and this was at the tail end of her moving away from Star. And um, there was a community, they were doing community watch. They were doing community watch because there was so much uh, gay bashing, you know, and stuff like that. I hadn't even known that uh, there were trans murders. I didn't know that there was all this onslaught of trans murders and stuff like that. But a couple of trans women, you know, were found dead in hotels and were murdered on the pier. And I had uh, known them. And uh, it was very hard for me to know that girls were being murdered and no one was doing anything about it, you know. So there was uh, an organization in, in California in the Tenderloin District uh, calling out the girls. It didn't, it didn't stay for so long, but I had went out to LA to visit a boyfriend that I thought I, we were gonna, you know, make it. But it was a short-lived relationship because he wanted to be with me and be with other people, and I didn't understand polyamory at that time. You know, I come from a, you know, a Christian space, one man, one wife. You know, I didn't come from the you with me and you with everybody else, and I, I, I couldn't bring my mind to that because once I see it, it's done. It's not forgivable for me. It's to this day, I, I can't share. You know, if I have a wife, she's my wife. She's not my wife and everybody else's wife. If I have a husband, he's my husband. And I have, you know what I'm saying? So my mind is very one track in that way. So calling out the girls in the Tenderloin District in California had, you know, opened me up to community organizing and, you know, uh, having had, you know, the experience to be the first of my kind in many spaces, not knowing 
that I was, um, you know, making other people, you know, feel comfortable because I can only always be myself. You know, I, I don't know how else to be because I've always been Marcia. You know, my mother loved me so much, she, she named me twice. She's like, you don't act like a Marcel, you act like a Marcia. And we were joking, but it, it stayed. And I said, how do you, spe do you spell it, M-A-R-C-I-A? She said, no, M-A-R-C-I-E, and you put a line on top of the, the E, and it's going to make an E-A bifton song, Marcia. And just she told me this whole story about um, I, I'm the embodiment of one of her father's sister. I'm the same stature, the same attitude, because my thing is don't tell me no. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go around you or underneath you or squeeze through. Go get, I'm going to figure out. Don't tell me no, because I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to ma manipulate somebody, and they're going to tell me yes. <laughs> you know, I was really bad as a child because I learned that skill early that I can get anything from anyone, the dimples, I have beautiful teeth in, and my eyes, and, you know, and I could just, I, I, I was a child with an adult mind. You know, it was really weird because I saw through a lot of older people crap. <laughs> I saw their foolishness and they thought they were fooling me, but I was fooling them and I'm really pulling their strings. So that stayed with me. And through the Tenderloin, they connected me to um, some people in New York. And those people in New York uh, told me about um, NDRI you know, uh, the National Institute of Fruit Drugs. And I, I went to NDRI and they gave me um, uh, pure education skills and, and, and then I, I learned about, you know, um, all these different things about oppression and, 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 and capitalism and, uh, you know, all these different things I started learning and empowering myself. And then I got connected to the Positive Health Project, which they they're responsible f for you know formulating the the longest running trans group in New York City under the auspices of Arlene Hoffman, a very dear friend of mine that I met her through the travels when I was discovering that I was a drag and queen. <laughs> Arlene Hoffman became like a, a a mentor and a sister to me. Uh, in all of that, you know, in, in, 19, uh, in 1988, I wind up having a judicial intervention, but I'm going to go back a little bit. I then, you know, meeting these drag queens, you know, I was working and stuff, and, you know, it was hard for me to be stable, you know. So were you, were you doing sex work at that point? This is what I was about to, that I had landed doing sex work. And I had a judicial intervention where a John had wanted me to bring somebody into a day that went bad. And I wind up being incarcerated from 1988 to 1996. I, I, I was incarcerated. And during my incarceration, I think that's when my, my need for the work and, and doing work in the community and community organizing you know, really became big because I was locked up and I was stripped of everything and it was like, I, I felt like I was like in a, you know, like I'm a bomb back novel, like, you know, a good girl like me wind up, how does a good girl like me wind up in a dump like this? You know, when I read that book, it's like, that's my life. Like, a good girl like me end up in a dump. It was like really crazy. I was stripped of everything. I couldn't believe it. It's like this craziness. Like I, I, I couldn't get a bra and because my gender marker, you know, I, I, I couldn't get a bra and I couldn't get a panty and I couldn't get makeup and I couldn't get hormones and I couldn't see the doctor and I couldn't go to church. Did they make you go to a men's? Yes, I was locked. In. I went to I went to uh, Green uh, Greenham, and and I and I stayed there for five years. And then uh, after that, I winded up into the Back to Life program, and they put me in the Baby Correctional Facility. And I, that's where I, I got in because I had had no crime. I had never. That was a big crime because the gentleman, unfortunately, that I took in a date, killed the John. So I became an accessory to murder, a felony, a one, you know, I'm a felon for the rest of my life. You know, I went through a lot of crap. And it was just that hiccup. It was, it was the hiccup in my life, you know. It's like that, 
dash you're born one day and that line and then the day that you're you, you you just depart from life and it was that dash that developed me into this woman that i am today because you know that experience is the highlight of what the why i do the work that i do you know why i i wanted to contribute to this you know documentary and archiving <clears throat> because there's so much girls I think, and for the people that might be listening to the story, that um, you know, it, for most of us that are born transsexual, have interactions with the law. You know, not because we want to, but because they're looking for us in that way. We're being poli policed to be criminalized, to be locked away because we're not supposed to be visible. You know, there, there, there's some kind of erasure tactic that it's there for, you know, the puppet master to say, let's get those people, let's round them up, let's lock them up, let's dehumanize them, let's criminalize them. You know, don't create jobs for them, don't create social programs for them, don't um, put them in drug treatment programs, don't give them homes. You know what I'm saying? Just, you know, let them even kill each other. You know, who cares? But just, you know, let's, let's be the first to get rid of them, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> It was very hard for me. I wrote to the district attorney a lot. <laughs> you know, I challenged everybody in the court system. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I you know, went through some molestations at Rikers Island before I had went upstate. You know, and um, may they rest in peace. I'm sure those men are dead by now, and I'm sure it had went on for a long time. And I'm sure that corrections knew that I, they have to know that some officers are doing those behaviors to women, and they're just looking the other way. You know, I mean, this is a big thing about the Catholic Church and boys, but everybody knows it's been going on, and everybody's been looking the other way, and nobody cares, and it's the same, you know, on the lower level, on the other end, that, you know, uh, transsexuals are raped and abused and whatever, and, you know, as a trans woman and, and being a transgender girl and transgender child, you know, I, I was, you know, uh, punished harshly. Even in my home, I, I, I seen my difference in my home that my brother or my sister could provoke me and if I defended myself, I was not allowed to. It's something in the psyche of society that the transgender person is not allowed to defend itself. And and, and I, I, I still have issue with, issues with that because that's, that's like an, a, a, a trauma that you know, I never, I never got cured. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm better with it. You know, I've learned to persevere through it, and I, I understand it. You know, I didn't understand it as a child. It's like, I'm human. It's like, why are you doing this to me? And this is what this person did to me. I didn't start it, and this person is doing this to me because of what somebody said that I'm not. <laughs> you know, but I am because if God made me and he made no junk, then I have a right to be and, and, and leave me alone. If you don't like how I am, then don't talk to me. You know, don't say nothing about me. Just let me be, you know, and I'm still in, in, in that mindset, you know. And so when you think back, it sounds like, as is so often, story like this mix of accepted and not yes which, which can be very hard to it, make it, sense it, of. it doesn't make sense it, it does it, it's stupid it does it makes no sense you know because my my sense of safety came from a Caribbean island and a family that's huge that was very buffering you know and transplanting myself to where there was no family and I'm in this world alone, and my family didn't prepare me for this world of aloneness. And I had to figure that out because I had a life, you know, for 20 years that was good. It was beautiful. You know, there was no issue. You know, I seen black doctors, black lawyers, black everything. You know, people look like me, sound like me, act like me. They had, you know, my same economics. You know, I was exposed in that community to that kind of stuff. And coming from Caribbean privilege is different and being transplanted to continental USA with no privilege. 
the only privilege I have is my, my, my curricular vitae and what I know that I know about myself, but then to navigate that in a space where people say, well, that's not who you are. This is who you are. You know, this is who you are. That's not who you are. This is who you are because I got to treat you by what these papers say that you are. You don't have a right to self-identify and say that you're that person because you're not. And I'm going to tell you that you're not. Why you're not? Because this paper says that you're not. But that paper cannot identify me. So you were saying that your, your sense of yourself started to really erode, which I imagine prison can't have helped. No, no. It, it, you know, it was like I, 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 I came from this beautiful place, came to a place that was like unfamiliar and unfriendly, and then I had been thrown into a place where that, you know, like I, I, I really, I, I connected to 12 Years a Slave when I watched a movie. I, I, I am him because I was in the Virgin Islands and I was free. And I came to the United States and I became a slave and I was treated as slave. And I was fighting, you know, through that whole slave system, you know, for eight years that had stripped me of everything because it's like, you know, my name was changed, but I had lost the documents. And because I, I hadn't had any you know documents that they figure out who I was by my social security number you know because moving around so much and not being stable you know until I had run into my sister Monique I ran into my sister Monique on 28th street and she was coming off the bus pregnant we we she had left to go to college and we had lost touch. I didn't even know she was in New York City. And uh, I had went to jail, all this stuff. My life had turned flip upside down and everything. And I, here I came out, you know, they just throw you out of jail, all abuse, no rehabilitation. And they give you that little bus ticket and you, you land, you know, right there in Penn Station. And there's nothing. And there are men waiting for you. They're pimps waiting for you as women. Now in 2018, I know that word is trafficking. Then that word was pimp, but I never knew that the pimp was such a horrible animal at, the, at that time. You know, and, and he was, he, he was, I met him and he took care of me for a minute but he became abusive and, 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 and abusive to the point where that I became abusive to him and when I started fighting him back and got the best of him, you know, I almost killed him. I almost killed him accidentally trying to defend myself. You know, I perforated his liver and um, because I had had documented which the police didn't take my calls of domestic violence seriously, right? Because you're two guys, and you're two black guys, and it's okay, box each other to death. They didn't see me as a woman. They didn't respect me as a woman. He didn't respect me as a woman because he told the police that I, that's a dude. And, and that, was, that, was, that was so degrading that the man that I thought loved me had totally erased me and devalued me that it made me kind of like stop dating black men for years. For years when he had said to the cops, you know, that's a dude. I stopped dating black men. They would come close to me and they would be most attractive and intelligent, but I just had no use for them. I, 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 I had put the kibosh and uh, it worked in my favor because, you know, once I started dating outside of my race, because it's like I had learned, I had run into another brick wall. Like I had to, to do a, a, an inventory, right? You know, there was drugs, there was street sex work, there was jail. I had a career, I was a nurse, I, I could make money. 
but how do I put all these stuff because I needed to get my document changed, I needed to get my gender marker changed, I needed to get stable housing, I needed to do all these things and it was like so overwhelming and so bigger than me that it was like, you know what, I, I just want to stay stone. <laughs> you know, I just want to get stone. I just don't want to think about all this kind of thing. But I had started meeting people that were, was introducing me to other people that were doing good things. She's a wonderful friend of mine, and I love her. I'm going to document this. You know, uh, Kiara St. James, who is now the CEO of, of uh, New York Transgender Advocacy Group. I, I met her, and uh, she was younger than I am. She was from, she's from Texas, and here it is, you know, me coming from the Virgin Islands, Honduras, all that. We 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 kind of connected because we were foreigners, and she was she's like maybe like five six years my junior, and she was so attractive and so smart, and she was just out there and she was having a bad time, and I just said to her, why don't you move in with me? And we could be roommates, and she's like, okay. And uh, she moved in with me, and we uh, started going to Planned Parenthood. And at Planned Parenthood, she used to do outreach. Uh, soon after that, I met the director at that time at Planned Parenthood, Shalise Williams. And Shalise Williams took a chance on me, and she sent me to the Department of Health to do the HIV and AIDS peer educators training. So I did that, and then she sent me again to back to the Department of Health, and I did the, the needle exchange certification. So then, you know, I added, you know, I had messed up, I had to hang my, my nurse's hats off because I had a felony, so I could not do dispensing. I had been picked up a couple of times because I was using heroin. I was picked up a couple of times for having syringes because you cannot, even though they never caught me with dope, they caught me with syringes and they'll lock me up because I had a syringe. So my nursing career was no more. I had had a felony. I would have to go back to nursing school again and do all that crap. And I didn't want to do it. You know, I mean, I, I had worked my butt off, but these little blurbs in my life had just like, and, and in a way, maybe God didn't want me to do that, right? You know, it, my grandmother always used to say, you planning, but God have a better plan. So I think it's like I make a joke. I say, if you want to make God laugh, tell him you have plans. <laughs> you want to make God laugh, tell him you got plans because he's in charge, you know. So, well, I got plans. He's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to tell you how the weather is. Wake up in the morning, <laughs> you know, plan. <laughs> you know, so I always laugh. I'm like, I got to take this in stride because he's in charge. And I learned all these good things. They hired me, and then after that, I met another gentleman, Imani Henry, but I had met, uh, in between that, this guy named Sam Orlando at the Lower East Side Needle Exchange. It took another chance on me, and I had to go out in the street with a backpack, with a whole bunch of needles, and at the time, it was very unsafe because the, the, the drug addicts and crackheads, they'll rob you and take all your stuff. Or, you know, they just do these crazy things to you. But luckily for me, like, the dope fiends and the crackheads that I knew liked me. And they listened to me. And they were looking up to me. And I'm like, I really like this feeling. I really like doing this. You know, I, I wish, you know, I could get paid, you know, for doing this. So when, once, once again, you know, I'm doing this needle exchange thing. And it's just like volunteer. We, we started getting paid. It wasn't much money. They created this type of thing and this peer educator thing and stuff like that. And um, I started meeting other people and doing all these community works and stuff. Um, I met a young lady, another young lady, uh, that took a chance on me and, 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 and sent me to an empowerment training. This is Maya, Maya Vasquez. Uh, she hired me soon after, and uh, I am like 30 years her senior. I'm 30 years her senior, but she's my boss. 
And I knew nothing about intersectionality or all these different sociological terms and everything. And she could just snatch a rabbit out of a hat. She knew she was like a magician to me and so gorgeous. And I was like so taken aback, like, oh my God, this girl is so young and she's so smart and she's a mover and shaker and she could write grants and this and that. And she was organizing and training and teaching and stuff. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to do that. I think I had a right to do that. And uh, Arlene Hoffman, you know, she's gone now. May she rest in peace. When I had got out of jail in 1996, I had nowhere to go and I was trying to navigate the system. She had allowed me to sleep on her couch for six months. And had her job known that she was allowing me there, she would have been fired. Was she at housing? She, she was at a positive health project when I was sleeping. And as a matter of fact, I had went to housing works for the uh, weaving project, but I was sick. I had gotten sick at, at the housing works at the weaving project because that was another like on the job training, you know, Winky Kyler and um, Uncle. Um, Oh my God, Charles King, we're both there um, doing it. I, knew, I know them both, you know. Uh, I call uh, Charles, Uncle Charles, he's Uncle Charles. He saw me fall and rise. And um, Sam and Howard Josepher of, of the, um, oh my God, oh my God, Phoenix House. I, I winded up going to the Phoenix House for substance abuse and recovery. And uh, uh, Howard Josepher was married to Sam Josepher at the time, and Sam was, the, they were co-executive of the Phoenix House. And uh, I, 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 I'm the first transsexual, transgender, Afro-American to complete the whole program. They had never had a transsexual, transgender in any substance abuse treatment program, so I was the first there. And Howard Josepher and Sam Josepher fought alongside with me and the community that was rejecting me and my presence in wanting to get recovery. You know, and uh, to this day, he's at um, on Washington Street with uh, the Arrive, Arrive, yeah, the Arrive program, and uh, I see him every so often, and. Um, He's, he's like like a muse to me, like a guru, that he saw he saw me grow. There was a uh, um, substance abuse and mental health component that they had developed at the Phoenix House, and then they moved to Arrive, and it was at the time being done at 11 Beach Street in Manhattan. And he said to me, because I have made it to the point now in my recovery where I can be out on my own for 24 hours without an escort, because there was a lot of transgenders coming in the program, and they would use me to buddy with the transgender girls and take them to appointments and stuff, because it's a part of the give back in, in, in substance abuse treatment that I'm an upper peer. I got to take care of the younger peer. And there's a girl that she's along for the ride, trying to clean herself up. I'm that example for that girl. Uh, I met many girls, but they will wind up. The program would get too hard for them, and they will wind up relapsing, or they'll wind up having sex with one of the, the community members and being caught and being asked to leave the program. So, you know, it, 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 it wasn't successful turnout. You know what I'm saying? It was always like something that the girls would come and they would be recalcitrant, you know? And it, it was just like so disheartening for me. But being at 11 Beach Street and completing the, um, it was like a 28, 28 uh, week cycle of substance abuse and mental health prevention to HIV. And that certificate was huge. It's huge to have in New York City because the state recognized. And from there, I took the pre and post test counseling certificate. You know, and then I moved on, you know, to doing. Um, the Positive Health Project created a component for Spanish speakers, because they just speak Spanish, is Taller de la Vida Positiva through the, the um, Department of Health. And I became the first Afro-Caribbean Latina trans to do 
positive health workshop facilitation for Spanish speakers. So, I mean, you know, I, I've been always being the first in spaces. I don't know why it is, you know, being a Leo, the ruler, the sun, you know, <laughs> you know, the, always thrown in leadership. You know, I, I don't think leaders are made, they're born, right? Leaders lead, followers follow. And I guess it was like probably being programming me that uh, you are a leader, you are not a follower. My father would always say that you are a chase and we lead, we don't follow. You know, we get along. And my thing is like, you know, I never felt, you know, like I wasn't contributing to the movement by being in the peanut gallery. You know, never felt because my, my thing in the movement and what's going on in the trans community with all the squabbles and stuff like that, that everybody thinks that their, their need supersedes the other need and like just one group that thinks that they have all the marbles and cronyism, so they'll issue out, you know, it's so nepotistic that it's so ridiculous that great leaders don't get, you know, day day in the sun. You know, great leaders because because nepotism or prejudice or what whatever those isms and schisms are, that separates the community from gaining traction and even trying to cross over into the feminist movement because trans issues are feminine issues. You know, and I, I don't know why the feminists have an issue with trans women. I've been to many feminist groups and I'm like a pariah in them spaces because I always say to them that we're women and we're not taking your space from that womanhood. It's just an identification, a classification, how we, how we identify. We're not claiming that we're no more or less. And if you're thinking in terms of uh, biology, some women cannot do the same thing just like we cannot do the same thing. You know what I'm saying? And whatever those words are and the politics behind those things that I don't see that. I just think about the bigger picture and they don't. So I, I divorce myself from feminine spaces, feminist spaces. So are you finding it that that's still the case? Yes, it is. Yes, it is because uh, um, even moving forward, you know, I'm a part of a, a group of women you know, we're, we're going to be making the um, Bayview Correctional Facility a transformative space into the women's building that's going to be opened in 2020. And I'm the trans girl there. <laughs> I'm the trans face there where that I'm included to the meeting. But I think that my contribution is limited because of these women that were incarcerated for so many years together that have this cohesive relationship and the whole biology and the whole prejudice that sometimes I don't feel in inclusive, but I'm empowered and I'm, 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 I'm so honored to sit at that table and hold that space and make some of them uncomfortable. I, I, I earn that. I earn that you're uncomfortable, that I'm here, that I'm walking with you, that maybe you may not want me there. Because I, I know it's uncomfortable for a lot of them. I know that because they have bonded on a different level and they, 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 none of them have tried, which, you know, it, it, it goes in the reverse to say that if I want it, I need to ask for it. But I think that it's a two-way street. But there's one woman that I really admire and um, that's Donna Hilton. And there's another lady there, um, um, Rusty. I had met Rusty at um, Chickatelli's. She was one of my trainers and one of my mentors. And this had happened really early, uh, uh, post-incarceration. Uh, when I came out in 97, I had met Rusty. And she had shared that she had had some issues with the intervention system and we bonded quickly and whenever I had issues I would pick up the phone and I would call Rusty and I would cry on the phone and she was just saying you know that's how it is you know you you, you got to keep pushing you know you, you cannot you know just stay there you, you got to move forward you know I mean this work is hard, it's painful, it's pankless, it's ugly, you know, it's cruel, and you just got to keep, you know, don't stop, you know, because I it, uh, was featured in a, in a book called Calling Out the Girls where that I had talked about, you know, um, rapes about trans women, and the, the th what I had really wanted to talk about is about more men are raped in jail than we know and they never talk about it. Men in prison that go to prison that get raped because, and I'm just gonna say, not to be disrespectful, they get punked out in jail 
and they, they become somebody's toilet in jail for their safety, and they walk out of jail with that trauma, and they come out and abuse women, and they never talk about it, and they never get cured. And you will always hear stories about other men getting raped, but you will never hear about their story of homosexuality or any of that stuff, because it didn't happen. You know, <laughs> you know it, and, 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 and that's, that's, that's really crazy, because for me, I was put in a lot of unsafe situation in prison, and then I was locked up for not being acquiescent. You know what I'm saying? Because if I don't do what is told, then I gotta be locked up, but then I wasn't treated fair, no equal, no respected. You know what I'm saying? So all those are traumatic. All those is very traumatic, right? And still, at this point, that I do have therapy. I have to. You know, because if I don't stay in therapy for the rest of my life, I'll probably be a basket case, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I stay in therapy. But um, that has moved me forward to the women's building and building something, I think, in the future for uh, trans women and cis women, you know, to partake in. Because I, I, I'm designing, you know, I don't like to say, you know, creating, I'm designing a program where we know that movement comes before language, right? And I want to put uh, a, a system where that women of different socioeconomic backgrounds and girls, but it's a program for girls, all lives is by community empowerment. Alice is what we call the cops. We refer to the police as Alice is coming, you know, Mag, you know, like that. So um, I, I have Alice is my, my shell, and then the Black Butterfly Project will be under that, like a subsidy. So tell me again, so spell Alice again. A-L-I-C-E, All Lives Inspire Community Empowerment. That's the acronym, you know. So changing cops to something positive. Yes, exactly, reowning it, you know, because, you know, if you hear a, a queen say Alice, she's talking about the cops, you know, that we created these little words that, you know, like a, the police might be in plain clothes and it's like, you know, that's Alice, right? <laughs> so that was a code word because, you know, in those days, honey, you have to run, snatch a wig, not break a keel, your heel, not break anything, run, snatch a wig, change the wig, reverse the dress, put on flats, try not to break a heel or a nail to get away from the cop. And I mean, we became good at it too. We would run, snatch a wig, just come, and then we'll go past the cop that might have been chasing us. Because, you know, having a wig for a black girl that is blonde, says Hooker. You know, a, a, a black girl just cannot put on a blonde wig or have red nails and just be hanging out. If she have on blonde hair and red nails, she's a hooker. It's, it, 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 it's, it's mind boggling to me that where the cops equated a blonde wig and red nails prostituting. I, I, it was so ridiculous to me. It's like, you know, if you had too much hair and your dress was too short, you're automatically being, you know, you couldn't stand on a corner for like 10 seconds. You know, if, if you walk in the other direction, you know, you, you couldn't be too beautiful or stick out because if you stuck out, that means that you were about to commit a crime. You are criminal. You, yeah, you are criminal by definition, automatically. Just being you is criminal to be you. And, you know, the funny part is we got to fix you. You need fixing. You know, and the only place to fix you is behind these bars. And, and, and it's, it's, it's so disheartening, you know, it's so disheartening. And, and that thinking still going on, you know, I'm so happy that right now that, you know, for the stop and frisk thing that the law that is being signed in order, got it yesterday, I kept a, a piece in New York clipping where that the cops is gonna have to give you the information of their name, and, and the reason for the search and seizure and stop, and they're gonna give you a Crime Stoppers card. But 
You, we know what protocol does, right? Like, this is what is supposed to happen, but this is what's not going to happen. You, you know what I'm saying? So I, I clapped the clipping that it's signed into law because, you know, the police beloved are just fighting back and saying that now what's going to happen is going to make cops just look the other way when it comes to crime because they don't want to identify why they're stopping you and why they have to give you all this information and why you as a citizen could get a cop copy of your arrest. <laughs> you should, you know, because America, we have more people incarcerated than any other civilized place in the world. And it's ridiculous that we have all these women that is locked away on, on, on drug charges, possession. I've met women in, in prison that is doing like half of a life but got other charges in prison because she might have got caught in the in the 70s or 80s with like 10, 10 bundles or something of heroin. But it was actually for her own personal use. But some crazy cop just decided that he wanted to lock her away and some evil judge says that uh, she's unfit to live in society knowing that in that situation there's no woman that's going to go into prison that may not have to defend herself you know but there's a there's an unspoken sisterhood that we're that we're thrown in there together with different coming from different socioeconomic backgrounds and we find a way as women because that was my experience we find a way as women to let those things fall apart and there's like a, a, a large majority, large majority that we become women, families, and raise each other and take care of each other. And we miss our children and our moms and our dads and our brothers and our sisters. And we really share, you know, our, 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 our paradox of faith and our, our perseverance and survival spirit. And, and even the women that knew that they'll never see freedom in that fight, you know, in whatever criminal act that she, you know, had to do, you know, whether, it, and, and most of the women are locked up, you know, are, are in there for defending themselves. So how connected I am. So I want to ask you a bunch of questions about that. One of the things that you said I thought was so beautiful was you said movement comes before language. Yes. So I want to ask you a little more about what you mean about that, by that. Um, and related to that, I want to ask you about um, describing yourself as a trans woman. Like, do you? Because I've been, I've talked to a number of women who no longer describe themselves that way. They say I'm a woman and I have trans experience. And I'm wondering, sort of, when you're talking about language. Okay, so language so that, see, language is is the crux, right? And I I, I speak more than one language. And this language, English, that I'm speaking might be limited. But maybe if I speak in Yoruba or I speak in Garifuna, I speak in Spanish, it might be more passionate. Oh, oh, and oh, and the other person beautiful. and the other person might be able to understand it in the second person. But I'm a, I'm gonna start with my self identification. And my self identification is like I never really did not hate my penis. I like my penis. My penis today is my clitoris and it was always a part of me that I always enjoy. So in my womanhood, I never was embarrassed as being a woman with a penis because I know I'm a woman, right? So that way I never, but see, I wasn't socialized in female ways. I was being socialized to be a boy. So that's where my transness come in because of that misgendering at birth as, oh, it's a male. They didn't know that I had a feminine spirit and I, I would not even, I, I, I would retract and say an, an, an overly exercised clitoris, right? Because I like nomenclature, right? And medically they will call it a penis. I had an overly exercised clitoris, right? And I never, I never really liked anal sex, straight up. It, it was never a thing that I enjoy. And I was lucky because I was endowed that men that was attracted to me liked my overly exercised clitoris. So for me, I was allowed to express my femininity in the total of all of its sense. Yes, I did have anal sex, but I used my, 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 my phallus, my clitoris, and my clitoris was stimulated 
as a part of me in allowing me to enjoy my feminine experience. You understand? So that's where I, I am a woman. I'm a woman. I, I am a trans woman. That's for me. I'm empowered by saying that I'm a trans woman. I'm a woman, but I, in, in that island experience, you know, I was a woman. I was a woman. You know, it wasn't anything, you know, I learned about the word translator because I was expressing and experiencing being a girl. You know, I was a majorette. My mother did my bangs and my Afro puffs, and I twirled the baton better than my sisters. I had a girl experience all my life, a female experience all my life, even up to the point that, you know, I had my daughter. You know, I am her father and her mother and her girlfriend and her sister, and she calls me Marcy. How beautiful my experience is that I did the 360 to going up to having, you know, uh, vaginoplasty because I cannot have gender reassignment, right? I don't like that word, gender reassignment. I, and, and I wish to could change it, and I don't even like, you know, gender confirming surgery. You know, language is late. It doesn't it doesn't catch up to what the experience really holds, right? Sex change. You cannot change a person's sex. You know, like you cannot change a person's sexual identity. You cannot change that. Sexual orientation above the waist. I mean, sexual orientation it, below the waist, what, what you like, you know, sexual identity above the waist, sexual orientation below the waist. You know what I'm saying? Those things that, that confuses people, you know, and, and I think for, for people that were told that in order to be, you know, a transsexual or transgender that you have to hate your penis, it's like for those people I think it's so ridiculous because my, my mother had this thing, even I can remember when I was like, three, four years old, like I never liked clothes. I'm a nudist, natural nudist. And being in an island where it's like 110 degrees every day, you don't want clothes, especially underwear, right? So, and you know, when you're training little boys to potty, it was nobody saying aim for the Cheerio. You can piss anywhere. Just it wants to come out. What a kid is gonna do, right? Relieve themselves anywhere. So I was like being taught, I guess, to be socialized male, you know, this overexercised clitoris, it was normal. I just peed anywhere, just pissed all over the place. And I grew up just like so free with my nudity and all that, you know, but still in respect to my family and stuff, because I had started growing my breasts at home by taking one of uh, my, one of my mother, mother's brother had a girlfriend from um, the Dominican Republic. Her name is Dahlia, and she used to arch my eyebrows for me. She's the one that taught me how to do my makeup. And I was wearing makeup when I was nine years old. I had both of my ears pierced when I was like seven years old. I wanted to do it. And I did one, and my, my, my older sister now, because I had an older sister than her, Micheline, may she rest in peace, she died in September 15th of, of 20, um, of 2017, um, uh, may she rest in peace, a year after my mom, you know. <laughs> and um, it was very hurtful because my, my eldest sister was like, mom, She's the one that made my nursing smock, and she was mom when mom was at work because mom used to have to work two jobs sometimes when she and dad had got divorced, and she kept up that level of lifestyle that we were used to. Mom did that, you know. We, we went without a lot. I knew when we just had like tea and crackers and she baked breads and stuff and she made clothes, you know, and I, I, I you know, I got her creativity and I, I took it to the sec second exponent, right? That she, she used to sew clothes and I used to stay with her and put, but I never knew that that was a part of my, my God-given queen talent. <laughs> God had put that in me that I didn't know that I was naturally creative with a sewing machine and fabric and stuff. And I had my baby sister, Irma, that I would take, I would destroy my mother cur curtains and I would make the most beautiful dresses for my baby sisters. <laughs> they didn't know. But I mean, when we were young, oh my God, my sisters and brothers, my mother used to buy bales of fabric and she, she would make clothes for me that was like, kind of like gender neutral, or I would tell her what I want because she, 
it was like they knew we were coming to church on Sunday, right? Because we were all dressed in the same fabric. <gasps> and I hated that, but I just I didn't want to look like my brother. And she would make these kind of like like uh, like two piece dashiki kind of Caribbean looking stuff. But I I wanted like like crappy tops, and I wanted like crappy tops with really huge like over exercise sleeves, and I wanted something. And she, my mother would work with me, and uh, people would see us and well, what is that? Is that a, they would always say, is that a girl? And she's like, that's my son, you know. And I would cringe, you know what I'm saying? I would cringe because I was little, but I would always run around the house. You can ask my sisters today. And I always just say, I'm a girl, and I will have a meltdown. I will have a meltdown. I will not go outside in all-boy clothes. I, I could not. Like, seven, eight years old, I, I, I just couldn't do it. I wanted to do the panties with the frills on the butt. And I, I guess because my sisters were doing it, right? And I wanted to be like them, but it was more than that. I knew inside that that tidy whitey don't do it. <laughs> I don't like that tidy whitey. It, 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 it's annoying. Please get it away from me. You know, that tidy whitey is not, I, I'll, I'll go without it. And my, my, my claim to gender neutral bathroom, it was the street, the air. I, I go anywhere in the street between cars and people is looking, and they will look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, it was normal for me because I go into a place and somebody will look at me like if I look kind of like iffy. And I said, can I go to the ladies' bathroom? And they'd be like, no. I'll just go right outside between two parked cars. Psh, let it go. Keep it moving. And for me, that's for me in my mind, I was doing something that was safe for me, not knowing like it was my, my claim to what's gender neutral with those people going to the bathroom, arguments. Of, you know, because I presented girl like early you know like 9 10 11 nothing really changed much about me all i did i didn't do a nose job i didn't and i had beautiful teeth I went through domestic violence that destroyed my embouchure but um that's my my definition to my trans connection and the thing with movement and when i say movement coming before language because uh, it's a natural mystic, right? It's a natural mystic to create and be laid to do something, right? Even for that kid that might, you know, they say might be like a quadruple. There's some kind of movement that's taking place, right? And there's something spiritual that is happening there that may not be contextual, you know, that we can't see it. But if we bring all those pieces together and try to name them, you know, in like movement, like how we communicate, and women coming from different socioeconomic groups with the things that are imprinted or not imprinted, visible and invisible, has a movement, right? And for us to be able to develop this larger sisterhood and a sense of protection with each other, I think we need to be put together to try and investigate and see if there are similarities or their parallelism. And that's my academic mind in coming together to put women together, to bring all them pieces together in an empowering way. And the women that might have the greatest uh, um, accessibility to economics will support the ones on the lower round, right? And, and bring them up to snuff. Because I will want my girls in the Bronx to go to Martha's Vineyard for summer, to see that experience, to see that it's possible, you know, to see that it's just like, uh, do you know about Cardi B? Yeah. Cardi B is a, a, a rapper, you know, from the Bronx, like she's the biggest rapper right now out, and uh, she was given out coats in Brooklyn, and she's from the Bronx, she's a Bronx born, you know, she's not like a Yale graduate, right? She was a stripper, and now she's the top female recording rap artist from the stripper pole to the Oscars and Grammys and everything, and quite an acclaimed actress. And, and that's the tangibles that I want to build and to create a program where that inner city kids and disadvantaged kids would have an opportunity 
on a more uh, um, larger scale from the girls' perspective to see Broadway, to touch Broadway, to be a part of Broadway, right? Because they're not get, get given enough girls these advantages, right? And girls, since we're the mother of it, right? We nurture everything. I think if we start with girls through the Black Butterfly Project, and you can be of any nationality and still be a black butterfly, because there's so much variations to butterflies. There are millions of butterflies out there. And there's some butterflies that are intersexed, right? They're intersex butterflies. They're butterflies that have both genders. And that's my task. You know, I have so much butterflies and it you know what? I'm gonna I have ask, some I'm no, sorry. You know what I want to see it. Oh, it's a rose and a butterfly and then I got a tramp oh, stamp. Beautiful. Yeah. So, so just so on the recording, I'm looking at a tattoo of a rose and a butterfly uh, yeah. on Marcia's sort of on her breast. Yes. Oh beautiful. Yes. Mm -hmm. So and black butterflies is a group an empowerment group for girls? It's an empowerment group for girls and um they have projects and they have to be a part of projects and uh, give back to, it's like a spin-off of unlike they're allowing girls to become Boy Scouts, right? This would be a, 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 a sort of a girls group and a mentoring kind of uh, situation for girls of different socioeconomic background, learning about community, learning about community development, protecting community, uh, cleaning up community, and being responsible for community uh, centavole, forget-me-nots, right? So that's, that's, that's what I want to do, that I'm working so hard to it. And, and that is, is, is going to be, I'm hoping, a part of the women's building, you know, that it's going to be in there. You know, it, it, it's, it's hard because I'm still granting and rewriting and, and looking for funding and, and, and looking for linkages and partnerships and building a, a, upon it and selling it. And uh, it's, it's coming to fruition. By 2020, well, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping 2019 summer that we're going to have a, you know, for girls, it would be, you know, a summer camp that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have Hopefully, 2019 for girls, uh, we'll probably have uh, six weeks in the summer that we um, teach girls, you know, about, you know, community organizing and pick a, a project that from the first day to two weeks before the ending of the program that whatever, you know, they come up in terms of economic development, that it's their business. So this is what I'm trying to do to figure out wh what space it would be held where that these girls, you know, and trans are, are included in it. Because I know a lot of girls know how to code. And um, that's the, the uh, STEMs uh, are outside of the reach for trans girls. And I, I want to open it up because, you know, science and technology and, and engineering and mathematics, trans can do it. But uh, they're not recognized and they're not opening up space for STEMs or selling STEMs through. Or trans are not thinking about STEMs because the thing is like survival and congruency supersedes education and I want to take that back. I want to let them know that education comes before congruency because if you're educated and then you have the economics, then you can, can be congruent, right? We, but you know, everybody, you know, some people want the horse before the cart, some people want the cart and then the horse and they start building. But you know, building up my community and, and trying to have a kinetic voice that we're that we are not lost academians. You know, because so much of trans women that are brilliant are not given the opportunity and they're not space. I'm one of them, ergo, that hadn't 
I really wanted to be a barrister, a, an attorney. <laughs> I want my, this is my Caribbean British education. Yes. I wanted to be a barrister. I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to be an attorney. And um, had I had the push, I, I settled for nursing because my mother was saying, like, you got the brains, you could be a doctor, 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 doctor. I did the whole health occupation thing. You know, I didn't think I was going to pass the, the license vocational nursing, nursing exam because they made it so hard. Like, when we was preparing for it, they made it seem so hard. And when I took it, it was easier. I studied stuff that I didn't need to study, but I would tell everybody when I went to, um, Take the RN exam, there was a piece for the RN exam, which was um, med search, um, mental health. I didn't concentrate on that piece. And I had missed the RN exam by four points. Just four points. And my heart, my, my, my heart and my self-esteem had dwindled. But I bounced back because my thing is like, I kept my LPN license active and I added my surgical tech to it. It got me into the operating room. Three days of work paid my rent. And I just been a workaholic and working and working. And when I decided just to step away from the nursing and just concentrate on the, social, the surgical technology, I made more money as a surgical tech than I did as an LPN. So I just left that and I stayed, you know, but it kept me locked away from the world. Once I get into the operating room, I was locked out from the world. And I was tired and I was just saving my money for my surgeries. You know, I just, you know, I didn't want to have anything to do with going to doctors and arguing with them and insurance and all of that. I just paid for my surgeries out of my pocket. And um, thank God that Obama had passed the laws and now I got help because in, in paying for these surgeries and having had these surgeries came complications. And I was being um, ignored I was being ignored by many doctors because I had sought some things out of New York City. I had two breast um, uh, augmentation surgeries. The first one in Mexico, they went through my stomach and they didn't close the cavity. That made me have such a horrible, horrible infection in my vagina and my stomach that almost killed me. I'm like cut in half and sewn back together. I had, well, this is going to be my third breast surgery that's going to be coming up soon. And uh, they messed me up, you know, in Mexico. For anybody listening to this, um, do not do plastic surgeries outside of America. Because the way they practice medicine outside of America is not the same. You know, some, some people do surgeries in their basement. You know, it's like the operating room is like literally a basement, you know, no ventilation, no, nothing that I really learned in surgical technology school, like the things that I had done to my body, which I didn't know, you know, needed aseptical measures and it wasn't done in the right way. And I'm, I'm glad I'm taking care of those things. And now, you know, I said at age 55, could you imagine I had, I had lived with like three titties, for like 10 years, like one of my implants had shifted and it created a bubble in the middle. I had had um, added injecting free flowing silicone for volume because my implants wasn't put behind the muscle, they were put in front of the muscle, but they dropped. And now they were sitting below my diaphragm, <laughs> you know, and I'm very busty because I'm a larger woman, so I needed to be busty but these doctors just took my money they i was a science project and a girl of color and they didn't care whether i lived or died you know and 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 that's another one of those um stitch you know in my flag that is a highlight that i wish i knew then what i know now to change subjects a little bit. You, you knew Marsha um, P. Johnson, and you knew Sylvia, and um, you and I are the same age. You were too young, obviously, to know that Stonewall happened when it happened. But when you learned about it, did it does it feel important to you? Does it, does it resonate for you as an important time? 
It resonates as an, as an important time because I spent a lot of time researching because I knew like I wasn't gay. My mother had so much different books in the house and I always read. I read about the John Madison Society. So, you know, I was learning about organizing and stuff like that. And I had read uh, a lot of stuff by um, Essex Hemphill and, um, uh, oh my God, James Baldwin, you know. And uh, my mother told me she almost met him in, in a nightclub, a cotton club in Harlem. He had left 10 minutes before she got there. And she took a picture, she took a, well, there was a picture that she took with another friend and a picture that somebody had taken of him and she said, I was there that night. She said, I, I got there 10 minutes after he got into that car. So she had, she had it matted that James Baldwin was getting into a car and she was standing in front of the Cotton Club. So that is like a highlight for me that my relationship like to my Jill, J, uh, James Baldwin, my James Baldwin is, I don't know if you know of Macy Gray. Macy uh, uh, Grayson, Macy? Mama Majors, Miss Majors? Okay. Miss Majors okay. that did all the stuff uh -huh. for the transgenders that, that have the alliance in, um, in uh, uh, Oakland. Uh -huh. She is, to me, James Baldwin to my mom. <laughs> okay. So, um, I know what they did is so poignant for the trans community that the, the whole story, you know, uh, it, 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 it cannot not be told, right? Because at that period in New York, you know, it was like unthought of, you know, that, um, you know, transgenders existed or they deserved, you know, humane treatment, you know, and, um, you know, they had the issues with the gay men, but I think that gay men were not being targeted the way trans women were being targeted and treated unfairly because that treatment has gotten a lot better, but it's still there, you know what I'm saying? And just to, 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 to see that at that time, and, and I, you may not like the word, that if you were trans, you were treated like the black people were treated. You know, so for Marsha, you know, because I, I think Marsha with the lighter skin color was more promoted, I mean, Sylvia was more promoted than Marsha, that only until Marsha died that she gained traction and notoriety because there was a white gay man uh, capitalizing on her story and her platform and, and telling her story and, and, and making it. But the, the thing is, and, and it's an insult to the, the, the black queer community and black trans community rejected Marsha because Marsha did not look the way that they assume, you know, a black trans woman supposed to look or behave or whatever. And they thought that uh, Marsha was mentally challenged or crazy. There were things going on, right? But she was the sweetest person. I knew her personally. And she was very intelligent because we used to smoke weed and we would laugh about Baba Black Sheep. I mean, she was so intelligent and, and quirky. And we sat up one night smoking weed and piff. And um, piff was something else, you know. No. Well, uh, sassafras. You know, if you smoke sassafras at the time, you know, it gave you what is concerned, that ecstasy effect. And it doesn't make your system dirty because that's something bohemian and stuff like that. And the bohemian, the, the beatniks, they were smoking sassafras in that, you know. And, uh, you know, the 80s, you know, I, I had learned, I smoked it, and I was like tripping, and I was like, oh my God, this is better than weed. <gasps> Oh my God, this is really crazy, but it's something natural. But they don't even tell the people that are smoking crystal meth that there's something natural 
that they could get high on that wouldn't hurt the system. But see, the hippies and the beatniks, they knew that you could smoke sassafras and get high and have that kind of, um, you, um, it's not, it's, 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 it's not a, 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 a um, inebriation, um, um, psychotic hypnosis kind of thing, you know what I'm saying? But it's like, it's a, a transcendental, uh, transcendental um, trip, you know, it's a, it, it heightens, your, your, it heightens your thought and, and like your sensory, you know, it's like if, if, if somebody's depressed, I wouldn't suggest that they smoke sassafras because they'll make them extremely depressed. But if you're happy and you're at a party, like you, like, woo, like you're really happy, you know, it like it heightens that, that feeling. And it, 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 it lasts. It lasts for a good while. It really lasts for a good while. And, and no one, I mean, in that little, small, little growing group that I was meeting with, that I was having all these experiences with, even Keith Haring, you know, and that I, I, I met him in, in those movements and in, in that time, you know. I didn't know him personally, but I seen him perform at, at, at Boys Bar, RuPaul was around. The trans community have a, a bad relationship with RuPaul in using the word, you know, um, tranny. But, um, you know, it's, 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 it's caustic to those younger uh, transgenders that didn't understand our, you know, because RuPaul is close to me age, our age, you know, that, you know, tranny was what? it had moved to. You know, I was stuck at Queen because from the Caribbean, I was being told I'm a queen. So for me, I'm a queen and it's okay. You know, I am a beautiful black queen today. I have my crown on, you know? <laughs> you know, I am a queen. I earned that. And um, before Marsha and, and, and Sylvia and the claiming of New York being the center of the trans right movement and stuff, there was the San Francisco Cafe. And I learned that from my godfather, uh, Glenn uh, Phillip, he lives in Brooklyn. My godfather is a gay man. Had, he knew I was always going to be trans. He was my mother beautician. He used to do my mother's and my sister's hair, and then he, he did my hair. He did my hair for the pageant that I won, and he put four falls on my hair. He gave me big hair. I looked like a black Barbie. It was it, the way he did my hair. I mean, I, I lost all the, I, some, well, my, my baby sister says she's had, she has some of those pictures. But I mean, I was so pretty. My godfather did my hair. He put all these barrel curls in my hair. I mean, it's like, there was like rumors, it's like, um, you were the prettiest queen we ever seen on a float. And I, and, I, and I wore my mother's wedding dress. This is a joke that my sister Allison, um, my mother was sitting in, in, in the audience of the pageant and they held a pageant in this big old arena called the Island Center and half of the Virgin Islands came out to see this faggot pageant. They called him Anti-Man. You know, there was an Anti-Man show. <laughs> and half the island came out, and my little area, Peter's was like, everybody came out to see the pageant. And it was so funny, they crowned me in, in a bathing suit, you know. <laughs> and my, my, my mother and my sister put this bathing suit together for me with like two straps, and then I had shells. And I took the strap off and then wrapped the straps around me. So I had shells here and just had a little bikini, kind of like an Indian thing, because, you know, we're Carib Indians, we're Indians. So my mother did this shell, she crocheted this shell thing and they put cardboards in it. So I had shell, I, my breast had grew at the time. And it was so funny because I think they never saw breast on a transsexual. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'm very aware of the time. We're gonna run out of time soon. I wanna ask you just a little bit more about Stonewall. Mm -hmm. so, so now it's a national monument um, and you know, it's a place where people gather when important things happen, like the Pulse Massacre mm -hmm. or the um, Equal Rights, you know, um, 
with marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, does that speak to you? Do you think that's important? Yeah, it, it's, it's very important, but I'm a little bit taken aback because I don't see an erected statue of Sylvia Marsha. And I think that it's a slap in the face to Sylvia Marsha for having thrown whomever, the, there's still a, a discrepancy with who threw the Molotov cocktail and who was there and who wasn't there and all that stuff. But from knowing both of them, they were both there. They, that's what they told me. So I'm going from their information and educating me about what's happening. And, you know, uh, Sylvia, you know, educated me about, you know, all that was happening and how she was the one that had built a relationship with the, uh, the, um, the chief of police at the time. And, you know, it was a lot of hard work and what Star was doing, how they were housing the girls. The girls were homeless and they had no place to go. And, and, and they were taking the girls off of the streets and bringing them to these apartments. And they, they were providing sandwiches for these girls with their own money. And, and not only gay men, the, there's pieces of the story, they were, they were feeding families and children and, and gay boys and gay girls and what they were doing and what Star was doing was so forward and ahead of the time that what all these uh, community-based organizations are doing now, they're, they're, they're like the, the, the great-grandchildren of the, the mindset of Sylvia and Marsha because they were taking care of their own and then some. Because I witnessed uh, Marsha, we were walking one time and we was, we was headed to the, the pier and she took off her shoe and gave it to a, a, a homeless guy sleeping in some cardboard. And I was looking at her, and that day, it was summer, the asphalt was really hot, and um, I was like, w w why are you doing that? And she's like, I'll, I'll find me another pair. And I said, but isn't it hot? She said, well, I got some water in a bag. If my, my foot get hot, I'll just throw water in my feet to cool it down. And And I was like, I was like, you are amazing, because I was like, this man is in a cardboard box. You can't see his face or his body. His feet is sticking out, and she just takes her shoes off and sits it on the box. Some, she was wearing some red, I would never figure it, figure it, some red and white Chuck Taylors. And she just sat, and, I, and I'm like, I, I, I was like so moved by it to be so selfless and, and for, the the uh, monument to not include either one of them is 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 is, is disheartening and and I think that what we all need to do is we need to figure out how to make them become included in that you know posterity and that symbolism because a bust or or a bust of Either, both of them, not, not singular. I'm not going to separate them at all. We, we need to create statues of both of them and erect it somewhere. And I think uh, facing away from Stonewall, because uh, it's about a transcendence of how far we've come. You know what I'm saying? Or in, 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 in a position where that uh, they're pointing like towards the sky or something that that speaks of what's what's bigger, what's what's to come. Because we we if we don't become globally connected in terms of humanity, I think we're going to be lost. You know, humanity is not going to have the same face because you know all has to be included. You know, not, nothing should be left out. None of the story, or, or people should not be erased from history. You know, and I look at that as, as an ouch for me. I don't even really go there that much because of that. Ba I don't see Sylvia and Marsha. I don't see them. I don't go to the park. I don't sit in the park. I don't walk around the park. I, I, I used to go to Stonewall. I had a bad experience going to Stonewall 
with not my now husband, but with a boyfriend that he had a New York ID, but not a New York driver's license. And I noticed that in Stonewall, they were letting all these people in. And I saw people didn't have IDs, but didn't look like me got in. But my husband had a New York ID and he couldn't get in. And I questioned the person at the door and the person at the door looked at me and called me a liar, and that was a Spanish lesbian. And I said, I just saw it. And I got, let me go in and I'll show you. And I brought the person and I said, did you show any ID at the door? And the person was like, I don't have to. And I'm like, why you don't have to? What ID do you have? And that person is like, I don't need ID. And I knew that person was not even nowhere supposed to be in that bar, but because of that person's color. And I saw that, and it, it, it left me with an ouch that he has a New York ID given by DMV, and he can't come in? He needs to have a New York driver's license? Where did, it's a New York ID. He just opened an account for $500 that day with that ID, and why is it not good enough to go into Stonewall? So I, I, I just... I never, I never associate with Stonewall. It's, it's an ouch for me. It means something to other people, you know, and I guess, you know, gay white men would be like so more connected to it than I am, but I don't have, you know, any kind of ties to it that if I don't go, I feel bad. But the park and the symbolism and the erasure and the disrespect for these women is my angst, is my angst. And I, and I, I think that, you know, the whole uh, park society and the organization needs to know that they need to erect something, you know what I'm saying, that commemorates. And I, I don't want to sound it like just like that limiting, but I think more celeb celebratory. Something celebratory of these two women that are erased from a very important part of gay history, of gay culture, of society on the whole, because they started that kinetic ball that rolled, that echoed all over the world, that gave birth to me and, and my freedoms and so many other women that were continuing the works to walk in their footsteps, to speak out for other people, about ourselves, because other people speak for themselves, I can't speak for them, but I mean, speaking in terms of giving that, you know, uh, uh, visibility, you know, and that's speaking, you know, because uh, print or, or visuality or video, you know, is language, right? And to add my face in archives and to have my story told, some young girl listening, would, would hear uh, of a uh, Afro-Caribbean Latina speaking and sharing her story, and I'm hoping that she could be moved to go and, and, and pull out and research and, 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 and look me up and, and see what I look like. You know, having heard my voice to say like, wow, this Marcy, Marcel, Chase, you know, person who was very interesting in 2017 when she recorded that. Wow, she grew up in the Virgin Islands. She was a girl. She was a transgender. She didn't know what it was. She came to New York. She heard the word drag and queen and she self-identified and, you know, she's a woman, post stop. But wow, she had an amazing life. She was a nurse. She was a surgical technologist. Now she's a community organizer. She created a program in the women's building. I could be her. I could be like her, or I am her, or her spirit is so much like mine, you know? And to leave that behind, you know, it's, it's, it's very important for me, you know? I'm gonna say thank you. And I say thank you for the honor.